Hello my friends, Super Mario Odyssey has been out for a few months now, and I finally finished my six hour long review, so it's time we talk about some deeper aspects of the game. There's obviously a lot of stuff that stands out in Mario's latest outing, but the end game itself is so substantial that I feel like it deserves its own video. I mean, before I even beat the game, one of the first things I read about it from other people was, the game starts after the credits. <laughs> and it's kind of true. I mean, we've never been given such a wealth of stuff to do after the end of a Mario game. It's like it wasn't enough for Nintendo to make Odyssey this ridiculously exciting and fun, they wanted to do everything they could to keep us playing, and for an unusually long time compared to past Marios. And it's not just about having a lot of moons to get either, it runs a lot deeper than that. So let's talk about what makes Super Mario Odyssey's endgame so special and why it set a very high standard for future titles. Then after that, a half hour analysis of the Mario 64 outfit and why it's objectively the best one in the game. Let's go. As I mentioned in my review, Mario's various adventures have included various end game elements that are various amounts of fun. I stand by my opinion that even the beloved Super Mario 64 has some bogus stars, including most of the 100 coin runs. Ugh. Sunshine though has some unanimously awful challenges and so many of the shines come from the stupid blue coins. Then to 100% galaxy, get every single star again with a slightly different character yay galaxy 2 is pretty good beating the game makes 120 extra green stars appear so it might be the previous end game winner 3d land and 3d world have good points and bad points as far as completion goes getting all the star coins is fun and both titles have quite a few extra levels after you beat the main game 3d land in fact has a whole eight additional worlds so that's certainly pretty great but then beating every level with every character and hitting the top of every flagpole for a single player that's kind of just a great big slog i found it enjoyable one time in a kind of mindless sort of way but i can't necessarily say it's ideal. Basically, there hasn't always been a great reason to keep playing past the credits beyond just wanting to say you really completed the game, especially with quote-unquote sandbox Marios. Uh, talking to Yoshi and flying around the castle as a reward sounded pretty good back when I was a kid and had like two games to play, but really it ain't much. Then a different picture at the end of Sunshine or something? I, I, I don't know, I, I've never been motivated to even try getting every shine, but I can't say that sounds very satisfying. But Super Mario Odyssey is different because more than ever the development developers realize that there's more incentive to playing than simply what you receive at the end. That's the key here. To do everything in a game and get a postcard or whatever at the end is pretty anticlimactic. It has no bearing on the game itself or how you play. The game is just really finally over at that point. And especially compared to those two old sandbox Marios, Odyssey is different because of how it continues to reward you once the credits have rolled, and it does this in a number of ways. First, all these moon rock things in every level get all cracky and breaky. You, you, you go and you break them, and they shoot out tons of new moons, like all over the place. Now all of a sudden, oh my gosh, now you've got a reason to explore every edge of every level again. These kingdoms are so awesome that even just this one thing that gets you back into them is phenomenal. Some of the moons do just sit around, and of course they're much easier to find since they're marked on the map, but they add so much new content to the game. It's just so much more Odyssey to play. If every single moon was in place the first time through the game, it would probably feel pretty overwhelming, so this is a best of both worlds kind of scenario. It's a little more comfortable to hunt down moons the first time through, and there's also that fun of coming back later for new experiences, new levels. The fun of just discovering that <gasps> there's more! And it also very cleverly keeps control of the game's difficulty. Naturally, games should get harder the more you play, so this holds some of the harder stuff until the end without just having to introduce a whole series of additional kingdoms or something. It's a very efficient use of game space and an example of very smart game design. Ah, but then of course, we do still get some additional kingdoms. Beating the game immediately unlocks the Mushroom Kingdom, a beautiful, relaxing place just filled with stuff to do. You can fight more challenging versions of all the game's bosses, there's a whole new set of purple coins to find, and you can even use Yoshi to hunt down apples and turn them into more moons. And off the subject, Yoshi Principle, I was totally right. Even if this isn't really what I meant, and I was right for the wrong reasons, so I wasn't really that right at all, still counts. Anyway, but even after unlocking the Mushroom Kingdom, <gasps> there's still somewhere left to go. Even after this nostalgic throwback level that would totally make a great end to the game, there's still more. That right there is a crazy incentive to keep grabbing up those moons. So you finally get enough moons to move on and you unlock the dark side of the moon, which you can listen to in the Odyssey's cabin. Money. It's crime. Wait, sorry, wrong dark side of the moon. No, you find yourself on this dark side. And right when you get there, what is the first thing you notice? What? There's, there's, 
there's more? Even after the ND Bonus Kingdom that against all odds came after the ND Bonus Kingdom? An even more endier, bonusier kingdom? So you keep playing. You want to see what's waiting for you. And of course, there's all the stuff to do on Dark Side, and this is so genius. There are a number of regular challenges here, but the biggest attraction is the veritable gallery of hint art on display. And what does hint art do for you? It gets you back into the other kingdoms, snooping around for the right visual cue to find a moon. It keeps you playing. Eventually, of course, you finally reach the actual final level, Darker Side, where you see that there's only one moon left to get. And uh, as something of an aside, I don't think anything in any game has scared me more than getting to Darker Side. <laughs> Seeing that one empty moon slot on the menu and being assaulted by encouragement from all the people from all the game's kingdoms, they're just like, you can do it, don't give up, you'll do great. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what on earth am I gonna have to do? <laughs> Mario has had some positively horrifying final bonus levels, so this time I was just shaking in my boots. Anyway, so all that's amazing. That's a tremendous amount of extra stuff to accomplish after you beat Bowser. Ah, but the end game is more than all that. I said earlier that the fun is more than just the prize at the end, but it's also more than additional levels to play and moons to get. The single most genius thing about Super Mario Odyssey's end game, and the thing that sets it apart from every other Mario game, including the ones with significant end game content like 3D Land and 3D World and Galaxy 2, is this. This little toadette right here. She gives you a huge list of what are essentially in-game achievements to earn. Now, I'll admit that the importance of this is largely subjective. I've heard plenty of people complain that there are so many moons that none of them feel like they're worth much, so they don't feel motivated to get them all. I do not feel the same way. I feel like each and every one is important and satisfying to nab, regardless of how easy or difficult it may be, just like stars and shine sprites and whatnot before this. I love getting moons, and I love getting lots of moons, and more moons is just more Mario Odyssey to play. So from my perspective, this achievement list means the world. Completing all this other in-game content is obviously fun all on its own. It's just a fun game, so playing more of it is a fun, good thing. But now on top of that, now you're constantly rewarded rewarded for playing. Buy hats, find warp holes, plant flowers, jump enough times. If it's in the game, there's probably an achievement for it. This turns the entire game into a series of completion challenges. It gives you a constant incentive to keep going, keep playing, keep getting and doing everything. During my first playthrough, I found myself returning here every, like, hour or maybe even less, excited to see if I'd earned any new ones, and basically every time, I had. Sometimes I'd be elated to earn ten or more all at once. It elicited a very pure and childlike sense of glee within me. And the great thing about these achievements is that none of them are just stupid, as is the case with a lot of achievements out there in the greater gaming world, in-game achievements or otherwise. There's no beat the whole game without getting hit, or get every moon in the Luncheon Kingdom without touching the ground, or whatever. There's there's no grinding here. It's all stuff that comes naturally through completing the game's various challenges. One might argue that this devalues the achievements for anyone looking for 100% completion because it's all stuff they were going to do anyway, but even as an aspiring Odyssey completionist myself, I certainly never felt that way. Having these tangible goals just made all that other stuff more fun. It made me more aware of all of it. And since I've already established I like getting moons, what was the reward for each of these achievements again? Oh, look at that! A moon! <laughs> I'll admit it's a little silly to be so into this. Once you've unlocked every level, moons don't really do anything, so getting more through these achievements really doesn't mean much. But darn it, I just don't care. I was always so stoked to go check on my chivos and add to my total. And I especially liked the achievements that rewarded me for stuff that wouldn't otherwise net me a moon. That, that really felt like it was worth something. Getting every purple coin and buying every souvenir in every level? Nah, it just kind of sounds like busy work. I don't think I'll... Oh, wait, you get a moon? Gimme! Hoarding coins in order to get most of the costumes? Nah, I'm happy with the ones I've got. Let me get those costumes. I need those moons! And the great thing is that at the end, when you finally get everything, you still do get a few fun little prizes. Most of them are cosmetic, but the invisibility suit is something that adds a whole new challenge to the game for those looking to test themselves. That's an actual practical prize, at least in some small way. And I think that is neat. Add all this stuff together, though, and you've got a more game that's hard to put down, to say the least. It uses so many clever little tricks to make sure you get as much out of the experience as possible. Which is really fortunate, seeing as it just happens to be, in this fellow's opinion, the most joyously fun game ever to sport Mario's face on the cover. And yes, that means even more fun than Dance Dance Revolution Mario Mix. They said it would never happen, I said it would never happen, but here we are, 
it has happened. Dance Dance Revolution Mario Mix has officially been dethroned. So what did you think? Did Odyssey's endgame content keep you playing for a long time? Did you ignore the achievements list? Did you end up getting every last moon? Did that last bound bowl finally break your spirit? Let me know down in the comments and I will catch you next time.